Hello, everyone. It's Friday. You know what that means. It's another uh, instance of relentless learning. I'm your host, Larry Apke. We're here most Fridays uh, to talk about two big ideas. Uh, and I appreciate you all joining us today. If you're not familiar with relentless learning, uh, I want to spend a few minutes to talk about that. Um, each week, uh, we have two big ideas. This week, we have Ron Lichty. He is in the, the green room, so to speak. I'm very excited to have him here. Uh, he's going to talk about exceptional user experience, make your mission a mantra. Uh, I'm going to talk about an idea called we don't mind being wrong as much as, much as we hate feeling wrong. Um, next week, we do this about once a month. we got a special event seminar. It's a little longer. Um, this is an hour and a half versus our normal 45-minute show. Um, I'm going to talk about HR in the VUCA world. Um, pretty interesting stuff. And uh, I'll, I'll show something else about that soon. Um, and then uh, the week after, we have Erica Lenz. Uh, she's going to present the triple concern of transformation, change dynamics from the manifesto to the larger environment. March 29th, we've got Chris Sims. Um, we've got some great shows coming up. I uh, hope, you, hope you can join us for those. This Relentless Learning is sponsored each week by something called the VUCA MBA. And for those of you who don't know, uh, I just want to explain briefly what the VUCA MBA is. VUCA stands for Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous. It's a term that comes to us from the acronym machine that we call the United States military. Um, it basically is trying to describe the world and how it's different these days. And uh, it's pretty important to know that. And I think most of us feel that. I mean, with all the changes that are going in with AI and, and, and uh, how quickly things change, et cetera, this is a VUCA world we live in. And we need to know how to, to not just you know, survive this VUCA world, but thrive in the VUCA world. And the way that we do that is, is we get ourselves a mindset for business agility. So that's what the MBA stands for. Um, you're not going to get a real master's of business. You're going to get a mindset for business agility. This is a class that I teach. Uh, and it's available for companies. I have a couple giveaways that I've been doing and people seem to like them, so I'll continue doing them. One is I have uh, written a book recently and published it. It's called Apke's Golden Rule of Agile, a focus on value delivery. Put a QR code up there. Uh, you can use your phone. Click the QR code. It's going to take you to a, to a page or a pop-up that looks like the, the thing on the left. You just put in your name and your email, and I'm going to send you a digital copy of it for free instead of having to go out and buy it. Uh, if you want to go out and buy it, that's fine. Um, and so um, I'm not going to spam you or anything like that. We'll send you reminders about relentless learning and things like that. You can always unsubscribe at any time, but it's it's nice to have you as part of the uh, relentless learning and get reminders. Uh, also, uh, give you a free hour of consulting on relative value estimation. It's something that I've done numerous times. Um, I, I want to be able to do that for you in your actual backlogs. Uh, it's very popular. So again, I want to offer that. So that's a free hour of consulting. There's a QR code for that. Uh, and I mentioned the exclusive seminar, HR in the VUCA world, which is going to happen next week. I'm really excited about this. There are so many topics about HR in the VUCA world that I'm going to discuss that I might have to do another one as I'm going through and putting the materials together. But we're going to talk about how do we need to make changes in HR so that it matches the VUCA world? Because uh, I, I don't know if any of you uh, have been looking for work or work in HR, but um, it, it certainly hasn't always kept up with the times. And the decisions that we make in HR don't always lead us to uh, what we would refer to sometimes as agility. There's some helpful links, um, tons of different ways to get a hold of me, tons of content that I have on YouTube, LinkedIn. You can get on my calendar. Uh, training testimonials that talk about how good the VUCA MBA is in the training that I do. So I encourage you to do that. I put those uh, in the comments as well um, for you if you want to. I want to remind people, um, if you have any comments or questions, please put them in the comments section here in LinkedIn, and we'll get to them uh, after the show, um, whether they be for me or Ron, or, or you just have any questions, you want us to tell us where you're coming to us from, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, that would be great. Um, and so that is uh, a little bit about VUCA MBA and relentless learning. Um, and so I appreciate that. I want to talk now about what I'm referring to is my big idea. Um, and the, the big idea itself is this. We as human beings uh, don't like 
feeling like we're wrong about things. Um, and I think we, we, we don't want to be wrong or feel like we're wrong more so than we actually want to be right. Um, so it's, it's about how we perceive the world and how we feel about the world. That's really, really important. And I, I wanted to start this quote unquote big idea with, with a story that some of you are familiar with. It's the parable of the blind men and the elephant. And this comes to us from Buddhist texts from around 500 BC, and it shows up in a lot of things uh, around that time. And, and, I, and I borrowed this uh, version of it, actually, um, from uh, somebody I'm going to uh, give credit to in just a second. Um, but the story goes something like this. Uh, six blind men are brought to examine an elephant that has come to their village. The first man touches the trunk and says that the elephant is like a thick snake. The second man touches the tusk and says that the elephant is like a spear. The third man touches the ear and says the elephant is like a fan. The fourth touches the leg and so, say that the elephant is like a tree. Uh, the fifth touches the side of the elephant and says the elephant is like a wall. And then the sixth touches the tail and says the elephant is like a rope. Each of the blind men is convinced that he is right and that everyone else is wrong. And the reasoning behind this is, is what I want to say is just a few things about this story. One, I believe, and there's scientific evidence, I believe, to, to uh, confirm this, that objective reality exists. This is the elephant. There is something outside of our perception that exists. That's the elephant. But our perception will only allow us to create within our own minds a subjective reality, a, a, a version of objective reality. This is the blind men and their, and their conception of what the elephant is. Um, the other thing that's important is the best way for us to truly understand What's going on is through science. We can, we can actually scientifically go up and, and start to look at the elephant. Uh, this, this would be like uh, in the parable uh, and the metaphor that the, these are people with sight. They're going to examine. They're going to measure. They're going to see what truly objective reality is. And it's science that gets us closer to discovering objective reality, because science is a process by where we say we don't know what reality is. We're going to take this process and we're going to try to figure it out. The last point that I want to make with this is I truly believe that the closer we come to objective reality using something like science, the more successful we are as human beings. And so we should strive to, instead of feeling like we're right about something, like the blind men, and being convinced that we're right about something because of our limited perception, we should strive to actually try to understand objective reality because when we do so, we're going to actually have more success. Now, I have taken some of this from uh, this person, uh, I, I don't want to make his name, uh, Mr. Bloom, who wrote an article, The Blind Man and the Elephant. And what it reminded me of, and they had the quote in his, his blog post, was it's not what you know that gets you in trouble. It's, it's not what you don't know. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. And this comes to us from Twain. We sometimes become so convinced of our own position that we neglect the fact that we have things to learn, that we cannot see objective reality as it is. We're, we're not capable as human beings. It's, we're not hardwired to do so. And so this is a real problem. Um, we believe that we see everything there is when we don't. And I've seen this in, in my training. I've seen this in my agile practice where, uh, and, and I'm not alone in this. I, I've talked with many other agile coaches about this and, and many other coaches, not just in, in the agile world, but personal coaches, executive coaches, et cetera is that the, one of the biggest problems we have is people come to us and say, yeah, I know Agile. I've been doing it for years and years and years. And 
it's really hard, therefore, to get through to people who think they already know, um, whether they do or not. And so we as coaches generally have a better uh, chance of actually being successful and influencing people when, when those people say, I don't know anything at all. If you had given me a choice between teaching somebody who says, I know agile and teaching somebody who says, I just heard the word agile yesterday, I'm going to take the, the latter because they're going to have the humility to, to approach the subject and, 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 and have an open mind. And the, the, the problem is this, it has to do with our inherent biases as human beings, why we want to feel right about something rather than just being right about something. We're not looking for objective truth necessary. We're not looking for objective reality. We're looking to confirm the subjective reality that we've created, the stories that we tell ourselves. I was just reading the book Sapiens, and, and they talk about this, um, the stories that we tell ourselves. We fall in love with the stories. And we have, uh, there was, there was uh, at some point in our evolution, there, there's a, an environmental uh, pressure or, or some kind of benefit to thinking that we're always right about something as opposed to, you know, the subjective versus objective reality. And, and so, um, interestingly enough, there are um, a multiple biases that we as human beings have that get in the way. And these are things that are hard coded into every single individual. I'm not special because I know they exist. I'm just as human as anybody else. And, and these biases, I'm just going to give you a few of the biases that nudge us to behave in this way. One of them is one of the most insidious biases of all, which is confirmation bias. We do not seek to find the truth. We seek to mold the truth into what we already think. We look for things that confirm what we believe as opposed to looking for things that would disconfirm it. And the scientific method is obviously finding things that would disconfirm what we believe to be true. Um, egocentric bias, self-serving bias, Dunning-Kruger effect, which I which I have just written recently uh, on LinkedIn, some of you might have seen. Um, choice supportive bias, backfire effect, sunk cost fallacy, belief perseverance, all of this stuff is really baked into our psyche. It's baked into our DNA as human beings. And it, and it causes us or, or forces us or nudges us, whatever word you want to use, into not necessarily seeing reality as it is, but trying to confirm what we already believe, trying to make our subjective reality all there is. And this is a problem. This is a real issue when it comes to when we talk about being successful, because the, again, I believe that the closer our subjective reality is to the objective reality, the more successful we're going to be. Though there's no guarantee in the VUCA world. Uh, you could do everything right and still lose in the VUCA world. That's just the way the world is. I think we all get that. We're all adults. So what is the hope? The hope is humility. I've often said, I'm not the only one. There's a lot of coaches who've said this. And there's a lot of great leaders who said this. We have to approach the world with humility. And it's not easy because we're not built to approach the world with humility. It's something we have to work on. It's something certainly I have to work on every day. But when we approach the world with humility, when we say we can't see everything there is, then we will start to figure out the ways that we can do it. And the, and the way that we do that is what science does. We assume to a certain degree that we're wrong in our perceptions and then try to make it right. So hopefully that was intelligible and something that will give some folks um, a little bit of help. And, and that's my big idea for the day is we have to be careful that we don't spend so much of our energy in trying to feel right and spend a little bit more energy actually being right. That said, I want to uh, bring to the stage right now uh, somebody I've known for many, many years, Ron Lichty. Um, and how are you doing today, Ron? Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Larry. It's great to be here. Ron and I go pretty far back, as I said before. Um, we've met each other, uh, I don't know, it was probably about six, seven, eight years ago. Um, Ron is a, has been managing software development in organizations for over 30 years. 
um, the last 25 in, in the era of Agile. Um, and for the last dozen or so years, he's been the, the principal and owner of, of Ron Lichty Consulting, um, where he takes on fractional interim VP engineering roles, trains and coaches teams and executives to become more effectively agile. Um, and he coaches leaders in managing software people and teams to make their software development hum. He, he wrote a, a wonderful book, um, some of you might be familiar with, Managing the Unmanageable Rules and Tools and Insights for Managing Software People and Teams. Um, and uh, it's now in its second edition, which is wonderful, and it's been translated into four different languages. Uh, he co-authors a study of product team performance and blogs about managing software people and teams at his uh, blog post uh, site, or his blog site, which uh, we put into the comments ahead of time. Lots of stuff. In addition to that, I also know personally, you're a pretty avid outdoors, outdoors person. And, and, and I think if I remember correctly, you like to do cross-country skiing. Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've done nine cross-country ski uh, marathon events, uh, actually fundraising for uh, to cure uh, uh, blood cancers. That's great. I mean, it's just, it's just super that you get out there. I know um, you've shared some pictures with me, and I think they're wonderful. Um, what did I miss? Is there anything else I missed? I mean, you've done a ton of things. I know that, that, that you've been around in and around software development for a very long time, and you're self-described uh, software development nerd. Um, what are the things you got going on? Yeah, so you know, I I, I grew my my um, from from being a programmer to uh, being a, a manager of programmers and a director of engineering and a VP of engineering and and as you said, a dozen years ago, I pivoted my career, wanting to make a difference to more to a broader uh, a broader section of teams, uh, so that I, I parachute in as a VP of engineering uh, on a, on occasion. Um, more often, I'm I'm brought in to assess what 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 is um, what's holding teams back, what's where the where the knots are that need to be untangled, what the, what's the chaos that needs clarity, and what's going to smooth, what's going to grease the the wheels so that software development actually hums, and it's uh, it's something that I'm passionate about and that I that I did for years and years as a manager and director and VP of engineering, and I love doing. Uh, so that's, that's uh, yeah. And, and one of the reasons, is, and I think you can tell this folks, if, if you don't, Ron, Ron and I are both very passionate about this subject and we've, we've had uh, many conversations about it. And it's always wonderful to have you here. I know that uh, you all have meetups and things and I've been fortunate enough to, to spend some time on your meetups and, and, and things of that nature and, and really appreciate the, the way you go about things. Um, we're going to make sure before this is through or shortly thereafter that um, we're going to have all the links and things so that you can contact Ron if you're interested in what he does. Um, but for now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to step out of the way. Um, Ron has his uh, pre presentation that he's going to do on um, uh, realizing except exceptional user experience hinges on making your mission a perpetual mantra or mantra, sorry, I pronounced that wrong. Um, I think that's the name of it. Anyway, you're going to give it to us. I'm going to get out of the way and let you go ahead and do your presentation. I'll see you in a little bit, Ron. Okay. So the point, the, the point that when, when Larry said, you know, what's, what's an aha that, um, that you'd like to share? And one of the things that I see over and over is that we who are leaders, and I mean leaders at every level. So engineering leaders, product leaders, scrum masters, um, uh, agile coaches, uh, we who are leaders don't do nearly enough to inspire and motivate our teams to deliver software that delights our customers. And specifically, um, one of the underlying contexts between that is that to inspire and motivate software teams and to inspire them to deliver exceptional user experiences we have to help we have to help everybody on those teams see how their work impacts users we have to make the connections and and part of the connection is the big picture part of the connection is the mission but part of the connection is what's every single thing that you're working on so let me ask you a question do you want your developers coding tickets or do you want them creating outstanding user experiences uh, I suspect that there's no one who's going to pick the first of those two choices. 
and achieving outstanding user experiences requires connecting the dots over and over between the work that every developer and every member of the product team is doing and uh, and tangible ways that they uh, that their efforts impact users. So realize, realizing um, exceptional user experiences hinges on continually highlighting the link between um, our efforts, each individual's efforts, and meaningful outcomes for users, which comes down to why I titled it Realizing Exceptional User Experiences Hinges on Making Mission for Every Developer and Every Member of Product Teams a Mantra. So there's there's this notion that I run into. So um, I said I, I parachute in uh, parachute in occasionally as a VP of engineering, and but fairly frequently, am called in to assess an organization to provide some recommendations for how to how to make their software development hum. And and there's this thing I run into very frequently where where leaders and company leaders engineering leaders, product leaders, uh, agile leaders will say, well, we told them the mission. We told them the mission at the beginning of the project, or we told the mission when we told them the mission when we hired them, or we told them the mission at kickoff. Um, so I, I start by listening and, and that's, that's, uh, I, <laughs> I frequently uh, will ask a question about, uh, do your, do, do your teams know their mission? And they'll say, yes, we told them. And then I'll go talk to developers and testers and designers and, uh, and too frequently what I hear is I'm working on tickets, but I don't know why. The, the, the team is not motivated to delight customers. In fact, too, too often they're not motivated at all. They're unmotivated. And, and they're just coding tickets. They're just being responsive. They don't remember, <laughs> they don't remember ever having the mission shared with them too often. And they don't know how the what the, the the ticket or the task or the story or the epic that they're currently working on is going to impact users. They don't know what the what the reason behind that is, what the difference that they could be making is. So how is it that leadership teams, whether it's company leadership or engineering leadership or product leadership or agile leadership, believes that their teams understand the mission? and understand the work that they're doing, the, the contribution that their work will be doing. And yet, when I talk to, to, to the people on the teams, they say, no, we don't, really, we don't really know what our mission is. We don't really know what, what this thing that we're working on, why, what, that's, what, that's, what difference that's gonna make. So how is it? And, and I think it's that too many of us in leadership don't understand how communication works. Now, frankly, um, salespeople understand how communication works. So if you ask any salesperson how often they have to repeat their message before they get a sale, every one of them's got a number. This is my experience anyway. Every one of them's got a number. Now, some, you know, they're all different numbers. So one person may say, well, I've got to, I've got to deliver my message seven times before I can make, before I'll make a sale. And another person will say it's nine times and I'll hear 13 and I might even hear as many as 17 from some salesperson. They're all different numbers, but they all follow the same principle. And that principle is to sell messages have to be repeated and they have to re be repeated a lot. They don't say it. The salespeople don't say it the same way. They don't say they don't deliver their message the same way every single time. All of those nine times, or thirteen times, or seventeen times, but they say a lot. And as leaders, we are in the sales business. We need every product development team member to know the mission and the vision and the big picture. And we also need every product development team member to know how their ticket their task, their story, their epic connects to the mission. So I've mostly been talking about motivation thus far. And so I wanna say a little bit more about motivation. So um, as, um, 
as Larry said, I'm the co-author of my fifth book, Managing the Unmanageable, Rules, Tools, and Insights for Managing Software People and Teams. And my co-author, Mickey Mantle, and I did an entire chapter on motivating, motivating the people on our teams. And one of the one of the things that we delve deep into into what motivates software developers specifically. And one of the things we realized is that more often than not, people became software developers because they wanted to make a difference. They wanted to make a difference in the world. They wanted to make it at some of where many of them, the way we learned software development was that we um, we wanted to make a difference to our um, our girlfriend or our boyfriend or our spouse or our kids or our parents. We wanted to, we would do a little bit of coding and see if we could get their eyes to light up. And, and that making a difference is, the, is, is a huge source of motivation. So how are, how are our people going to know that the contribution that a ticket's gonna make, we as leaders have to connect the dots. We have to connect the dots between the tickets that they're working on, the stories, the tasks, the epics that they're working on, and the impact on customers. So um, I cut my teeth as a manager at Apple Computer, now known as Apple. It was known as Apple Computer when I was there a few decades ago. I, was, I spent uh, seven years there, the last three of which I was managing the team that develops the UX of Macintosh. And one of the, and, um, one of the things that I'm going to tell you that I don't tell a whole a whole lot of people, not for any particular reason, but but because it seems off topic, is that between being between growing up a nerd because I did grow up a nerd from the time I was in fourth grade, I can look back and say, oh, I was building I was building radio kits. I'm definitely a nerd in the fourth grade. Um, between being a nerd and being a nerd, I stepped out and was a newspaper reporter, photographer graphic designer. And one of the things that, and so I wrote, I wrote a lot of news, but I also wrote a lot of features on a, on a daily newspaper. And when I'd write a feature, I would, I, you know, the goal of a feature is to tell a story and to touch readers in some way and in, in, in all different ways, but in some way, the goal of a feature is to touch readers. And, and it's not just the words. This was a early learning for me as it's not just the words, but it's also the presentation. And so I would work with a layout artist to get that thing laid out. I'd go back in the, in the layout shop. And, and this was before digital publishing uh, when, the, when there was something called hot wax and, and you'd take all the copy and the headlines and the photographs and the, uh, and the uh, pullout quotes and you'd, you'd run those pieces of paper through this through uh, uh, this set of rollers, and it would put a thin layer of, uh, of hot wax on the bottom of the of, of each of those pieces uh, of paper as an adhesive, and then you'd have this big layout sheet for the for the newspaper, and the the uh, graphic designer, the layout artist, would lay down would would lay that. Uh, all the copy and pull out quotes and, and headlines and photographs all down. And our goal was to tell a story. And, and uh, so I'm telling this to my finder team. I'm telling this story to the developers who are working on the Macintosh's user, user, inter user interface and user experience. Because once in a while, we get that page laid out, that feature laid out, and, and he and I would look at it and say, that's not telling the story. And he would not hesitate. He'd immediately been, be ripping the copy and the headlines and the, and the pull-out quotes and the, and the photographs back off the page and we'd start over. And the message that I was giving to my finder team was, we need to be willing to take, to take all the code we've written for that feature and throw it away and start over because our goal is to delight users. And if we're not doing it, we have to get there. So at Apple, I hired for stellar C++ capabilities. 
but I also hired for a characteristic, a characteristic that I referred to as customer empathy. And I think that's one of the things that we want to look for. We want to nurture, we want to mentor, but part of mentoring and nurturing that is connecting the dots, realizing exceptional customer, exceptional user experience hinges on continuously highlighting the link between developers' efforts and meaningful outcomes for our users. Realizing exceptional user experiences hinges on making our mission a mantra. And it's the big mission, but it's also the, the connecting the dots for every member of the product team for the work they're doing and the impact they're gonna have on users. So Larry, I'll bring you back in at this point. That's great, and the and the timing was was awesome. Um, I love hearing the the stories, the Apple stories. I know that that we we've, we've uh, you know had, had dinners and and, and uh, drinks and what, what have you, and talked about this uh, sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm I'm sure the audience is is pretty interested as well. I want to remind folks, um, we've got a pretty good crowd here today. If you have any questions uh, or comments, please put them in the comments, and, and we'll get to them certainly afterwards. Um, your book, I want to talk a little bit about your book, because I think that's mm -hmm. one of the very first things that, that kind of drew me to you and, and what you had to say, is I love when people are, you know, write a book, and, and then you can sit down with the, the ideas and, and, and really get to understand where people are coming from. Um, how old is the book now? So the the we the the first edition. So, so there's multiple answers to that question. The first edition came out in 2012. 2012. So 12 years ago. Second edition came out three years ago. We began working on the book. So my co-author and I, Mickey Mantle and I, began working on the book. It took us eight years to write that book. Wow. So yeah. what is that? Um, well, that's 2004. So that's 20 years. 20 years ago. Yeah, 2004, I think we began working on the book. And 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 I had known Mickey. So you and I have a relationship, Larry, and I had known Mickey because when I left Apple, I went to Berkeley Systems, which was a screensaver company, after dark, flying toasters, fish, moiré patterns, all those kinds of things that we used to, to preserve our CRT screens back in the day. And I and I, I had my first director of engineering role. And Berkeley Systems anticipated that the other two lines that they were just starting would would, would have this 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 mushrooming effect of sales that uh, screensavers had had, and they didn't. And so they they were pulling back, and they did they they were doing a riff, and they offered me the opportunity to to stay on one of the teams, and I then director of engineering, and I really loved it, wanted to continue doing that, and, and I immediately began uh, interviewing. <laughs> and about two weeks later, I had three offers. But just before that, I interviewed with this guy, Mickey Mantle, who was who was um, VP of Engineering and CTO at Broaderbund, which you might remember for um, for uh, where in the world is Carmen San Diego, and for the living living books series of children's uh, animated uh, online children's books, and for a uh, mist and other. Um, uh, uh, searching through and for print shop and for these wonderful these wonderful things, and I interviewed with Mickey and it was and, and he and I had a conversation like you and I have, Larry, during this interview. And I came out of the interview and thought, oh, I want to continue that conversation. So I had three offers. I took one of them, but I called Mickey back and said, I'm sorry, I, I need to pull out of out of interview with you, but I'd really love to continue the conversation we were having. Could we have breakfast together some some weekend? And we began having breakfast together over every every month or two over the course of the next 10 years. And we had found ourselves sharing rules of thumb and nuggets of wisdom about managing software teams over the breakfast table. And at some point, at some point, Mickey said to me, you've written four books. I've wanted to write a book. Maybe we could write your fifth, my first book together. And what I, and one of the things I want to do with that is I want to pull together all of those rules of thumb and nuggets of wisdom that we've been sharing with each other, and 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 then and then we should write some chapters uh, about from our experience. 
of, of managing and growing and hiring and, and onboarding and motivating and developing software using teams, using software people and teams. So that was the, that's a long answer to your question. Sorry. No, no, I think it's a great, it's great. I love to hear the stories because, you know, when you start talking about these stories, I start remembering when you say broader bun, I almost forgot about that. And, 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 Believe it or not, early in my career, I used to make personalized screensavers for, for people, um, friends and whatnot. Um, that's not a thing anymore. Um, so so the youngins out, out there probably don't know what we're talking about. But the, the, the story with, with Mickey is interesting. I, I, I'm, I'm curious. I, I know that uh, we've talked about this before, but you have four other books. Are, are, are any of the other books things that, that people you know, who are interested in IT interested in or are they different? things uh so the previous two books had been programming books mm -hmm. uh and they were programming in assembly language at a time when programming in assembly language was a popular thing to do mm. and just ordinary ordinary buyers of personal computers would uh would say oh I'll, let me program oh i know i'll program in assembly language <laughs> So not a lot of that lately. Yeah, not 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 as appropriate as the book as, as the the book managing software development or managing the unmanageable. Um, when we talk about that, you say now you're in your second edition. Yeah, and so the folks will probably want to know. I mean, major changes between first and second edition updates, or did the first one really kind of knock it out of the park, and the world hasn't changed that much? So uh, yes and no. <laughs> The first one really did pretty much knock it out of the park, and um, and we we went through it, and it had nine chapters written around those three hundred rules of thumb. And for the second edition, we only changed out a half dozen or so of the rules of thumb to to grab some some that we thought were just so compelling that they needed to be in the book itself. And we we continue to collect rules of thumb, and there are, there are a bunch of them on the uh, managing the unmanageable .net website. Um, that um, if you haven't paid, if Larry hasn't pasted it into the comments, he's going to paste that that URL into the comments. There's a page of there's a long page of a con continued gathering of those rules of thumb. But the one thing that we that we added, we added a tenth chapter to the second edition, and that chapter was uh, was a question that we had gotten asked by manager after manager after manager after the first edition came out, which was. Now that we're agile, what's my job? Mm. And there's and and we had dealt with that all the way through those nine chapters, and and we're still getting the question. We thought, okay, so we're going to have to directly address this. And so we we added, I think there's another twenty five pages, mm. maybe of because there's a really significant role that managers play in in evangelizing their teams in, in um, uh, fending off distractions for their teams, mm. in, um, in nurturing agility, in nurturing being agile, not just doing agile, but being right. agile. There are so many, there are so many great roles that, that managers make a can make a contribution, but you've got to really think through the change in those roles from pre-agile to agile. And I and I think that's still a a, a, a change that we're, uh, that we're that we're engaged in. There's, right. there's an awful lot of teams doing agile practices and not being agile out there. Right. Well, the the, the interesting th thing for me when I asked you that question, of course, I knew the answer because because we probably talked about this before, but. <laughs> You look back, you go back and, and you look at the work that, that you and Mickey did on, on the first book, which you started 20 years ago. Um, and we know that the world has changed a lot. We've had, you know, AI, we've had boom and bust. Uh, I don't know how many times in the economy or whatever it is, um, you know, things. And uh, we've had fads in Silicon Valley and uh, that, that I'm sure you're aware of. But the bulk of the stuff, which, which is the, the most interesting part to me, hasn't changed that much. So my question to a lot of people and a lot of coaches, and I don't know the answer to it, and, and I don't know if any individual does, but I want to get your take on it, is if we know these things to be true, and we've known these things for a long time, 20, 30, 40 years in some cases, why do we keep behaving as if these things aren't true? Do you have any 
thoughts on that? Yeah, I, you know, we, so those of us who are engineering managers, typically were programmers the day before. And some, and, and typically we were good programmers the day before. And somebody said, oh, you're a great programmer and, but you've got some people skills too. You be the manager mm -hmm. and taps you on the head. And, and um, frankly, most of us pulled our way into being programmers, male, female, doesn't matter. We, we, we pushed and, and shoved and, and, and our, our intellect, our, our, whatever that whatever that is we pushed our way into being into being programmers and being good programmers and we thought okay so all i have to do is bowl my way into being a good manager mm -hmm. and i think that i i and, it, <laughs> and, and i look back on my first managing when i was at apple and i have i actually apologized to my first hire while i was there in his first three or four months because mm -hmm. Apple had some some really good coursework for managers, and one of the uh, one of those was situational. It was a class called situational leadership, and I went off to situational leadership, and <laughs> and said, "Oh, I've got this kid just out of college who's my first hire, who I've been throwing in the deep end to see whether he can sink or swim because that's how I was managed." Yeah. And so you know, a lot of us, our experience of managing. Our managers weren't that good, but we think that's what managing looks like. Hmm. It's it, it's it's interesting that you say that because I, I had I had a similar thing when I was uh, managing software. we were basically one of the guys on my team. I, I talk about this in my class and, and probably talked about it on this show or other places. Um, where he said to me basically, Larry, you're a good guy, but you don't know what the hell you're doing. Um, <laughs> and that was kind of what started me on this this agile journey. Um, more so than anything. I mean, it was just, it was part of it, but it's probably the biggest part where, where he gave me a book, which is very similar to yours, um, which you're familiar with called people where I'm sure. And he mm -hmm. said, you need to read this book because you don't know what you're doing. You don't, you don't understand your job. And he was nice enough to do it. His name, Jim Barrows. I, I have to give him credit for it. I, I'm sure Jim is still out there kicking one of the best developers I ever worked with. And, and he had the, the kindness, I guess, to be direct with me and said, read this book, it will make you better at your job. Um, I think it's the same with your book. I mean, if he had given me your book, if your book was around instead, I think this was before your book came out, it'd probably have the same effect on me. Do you, I'm wondering, because it's been out there a long time, there's a lot of folks who've read your book. And I, and I again, I'm very curious about books myself, but do you ever get people uh, just kind of out of the blue saying, hey, I read your book, you know, and uh, 10 years ago, and it really helped me or, or you know, <laughs> things like that? Yeah, we we do, and, and we get uh, we get Amazon reviews to that effect uh, as well. So people people we have it's like where did that come from? Uh, well, you, you know that that's what happens when you write books is that people you don't know suddenly know who you are and what you think and and how you yeah. think about it. Um, one of the interesting things was that uh, as Mickey and I discussed this, we thought. Oh well, those those three hundred rules of thumb that that we're gonna that are gonna be the center section of the book, the the center. I think it's forty pages of the book. Um, that's that's what people will call out, and a few people do. But but we'll get someone who says, "Oh man, your chapter on hiring." Mm -hmm. It was it was that was that was amazing. That was just what I needed. It it it, uh, it, it or or. Um, uh, I, you know, the onboard, onboarding is, is, uh, we were so remiss in onboarding and it, and it, and, and we really got on top of it as a result of that. Or they'll talk about, you know, I needed to manage up and they, your, your chapter on managing, managing your boss mm -hmm. was so important to me because I had no idea about how to do that. Or, you know, and so, or motivating teams, you know, the, 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 right. the topic of, of today. Uh, your chapter on motivating teams so informed me on how uh, on what matters to my team and my people, and how I and how I need to and how I need to connect the dots and make things matter and and uh, and, uh, and and so we and so 
each time we'll think, oh, it was it was that chapter that was the important thing, and then somebody else will will want another chapter, and it, it you know it really touches people where with the with the problems they've got, which is which is what we were hoping for. Actually, sure. we were we we did not find uh, short of people where there were not there were there were almost no books on managing software people and teams. Um, at the point at which Mickey and I became managers ourselves, and and um, and we wanted to to you know, we had to bowl our way through, and we wanted to share the learnings that um, that we got and what we wish we'd known before we became managers. And that's a journey that started a long time ago, and it continues to this day. Um, you're still doing that kind of work, and and I appreciate it. I, I'm looking at our time; we're, we're going to run out of time here shortly. Um, before I get into uh, the closing uh, the closing thoughts from you, Ron, I just want to remind the folks who are here today, we do this most Fridays. Next week, we're going to do a, a more in-depth seminar on HR and the VUCA world. And then the week after that, we have Erica Lenz. Um, we always have great guests like Ron. Um, so please join us if you can every week. We'll send you reminders, et cetera. Hey, Ron, I'm going to give you the last word today. Um, you have spent literally a, a large part of your life, understanding software development, understanding how to manage software developers, specifically in this world of, of agility. Um, if you had one bit of advice to any manager out there who's managing software developers today, what would be that one bit of advice? Mm. My, my core um, rule of thumb has become software development as a team sport. And we too often are focused on, you know, uh, uh, you know, we need to focus on the individuals, but too often we're focused on the, uh, you know, what's the productivity of Bob or Sue or Sally or Rajiv, instead of what are the outcomes that our teams are crafting and creating and hopefully delighting our customers with. That's wonderful. It's great parting words. I thank you so much, Ron, for joining us. It's great to see you again. I, I wish uh, for you and, and everybody who joined us today to have a wonderful weekend. It's obviously available for folks in the future uh, via LinkedIn live event. So you can capture this. If you didn't make it live, you can always see it uh, on the web later. I hope you have a wonderful day, wonderful weekend. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Larry. It's been a delight.